Hi, right, okay, so we're gonna talk about thoracic outlets and inlets. This is mostly to solve some naming confusion. What is the thoracic inlet? What is the thoracic outlet? What is the superior thoracic aperture? What is the inferior thoracic aperture? We'll do that. We'll do the anatomy, why it's relevant. And then we'll talk about um, thoracic outlet syndrome. So you might come across these different terms being used and you want to be super clear on what the person is talking about. So us anatomists might use a different term, uh, clinicians, surgeons will often use another term um, and so on. Okay, so the thoracic outlet, so obviously we're talking about the th thorax, do you know what the thoracic outlet is? The thoracic outlet is that hole there. So up here we've got this opening, haven't we? So that is the thoracic outlet because blood vessels uh, and what have you are leaving the thorax through the thoracic outlet. Okay, where is the thoracic inlet? It's, it's there, it's the same, it's the same hole <laughs> because stuff's going in through the thoracic inlet to the thorax, all right? Um, where, now, the other two names are much more sensible, aren't they? Where is the superior thoracic aperture? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, it's the same hole. And that makes sense because we've got the thorax, it's got an aperture here, an opening here, and it's got an opening down here. So this, this hole here is the superior thoracic aperture, or the thoracic outlet, or the thoracic inlet. So that leaves the inferior thoracic aperture, and that's this one here. Okay, so what's the anatomy here then? The superior thoracic aperture, then, it's the, the we have the T1 vertebra, we have the first rib, and then we have the superior part of the manubrium of the sternum. That forms the superior thoracic aperture and the thoracic outlet and the thoracic inlet. Um, so what passes through there? Well, whoop. you worked it out, you remember? Of course, we've got the... Um, so we've got the, the veins here. We can see the veins going back into the thorax through the superior thoracic aperture. These are the brachiocephalic veins. We've got two brachiocephalic veins there, draining from the subclavian vein and the internal uh, jugular vein, right? Um, and then we can also see, well, on, the, on this side, we've had, we'd have the, so the big artery from the arch of the aorta. The brachiocephalic trunk moves off to the right and gives off the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. And then on the left side, we'd have the, the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery directly coming off the arch of the aorta. Those guys are running through the thoracic outlet. And then we've got the trachea and the esophagus. So those are the big structures that are running through the thoracic aperture. We've got some nerves as well. We've been talking about those nerves recently, haven't we? You know, phrenic, vagus, um, recurrent laryngeal. So what about the inferior thoracic aperture? Well, um, we've got the T12 vertebra, because we've got the last rib, sorry, T12. Five, four, three, two, one, T12. Um, and then we have the 12th and 11th ribs, which are floating. And then we come across to the, the costal margin here. So the costal cartilage that's joining all of these ribs together. So those ribs, to the costal margin and then up to the xiphoid process of the sternum. That is the boundary of the inferior thoracic aperture. And this, of course, this boundary is actually closed by the diaphragm. But you must remember that the diaphragm is, you know, it's domed most of the time, so it pushes up into the thoracic cage. So the lungs are actually quite small and the liver's pushed up here and that sort of thing. But the inferior thoracic aperture is closed by the diaphragm, separating the thoracic cage from the abdominal cavity that's made from all the, the soft tissues that are attached to the bones there. And that's it. But the other thing is, of course, when we're talking about these terms, the other term is thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is a little awkward because often thoracic outlet syndrome hasn't really got anything to do with the thoracic outlet. Um, Thoracic outlet syndrome covers a number of signs and symptoms, and really they're usually concerning structures that are going to the upper limbs. So 
they're often actually in kind of the, the base of the neck down here. And they might be structures that are passing through the gap between the clavicle and the first rib, or they might be the brachial plexus coming out from between the scalene muscles. So what happens is these neurovascular structures, either the subclavian artery or the subclavian vein, which is supplying blood to the upper limb or draining blood from the upper limb, they might be compressed by something which means that the limb isn't getting enough blood or blood isn't draining from the limb very well, which will give you different symptoms, or the brachial plexus. And look, these things are running out not through the superior thoracic aperture, they're superior to that, superior to the superior thoracic aperture, but they're running through this other gap here. They've got to run through this gap. So they've got to run deep to the clavicle to get to the upper limb. So there's the subclavian artery, subclavian vein. And, you know, so you can imagine that. What might cause compression in this region? Well, look at these scalene muscles on either side of the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. So enlargement of the anterior scalene muscle could compress the brachial plexus, giving nerve symptoms. So you'd have some, maybe not the whole upper limb, just specific to bits of the upper limb because only bits of the brachial plexus are being compressed. But then you'll get neurological signs and symptoms in the upper limb, you know, numbness and weakness and that sort of thing. Um, or it could be due to trauma because, you know, this region is fairly exposed. Or there could be a tumour, there could be a growth in this region somewhere that's pushing on these structures that are passing to the upper limb. Or, as is uh, sometimes the case, I think often the case, is um, repetitive strain injury. So, you know, um, repetitive movements cause um, compression of these injuries, of these structures as they're passing through these spaces. Also congenital abnormalities, you know, we've got a gap here between the first rib and the clavicle. So a congenital abnormality that makes that gap between the clavicle and the first rib narrower could cause compression of these structures and maybe not at birth but later in life with growth and other changes. So thoracic outlet syndrome isn't really about structures passing through the thoracic outlet, they're about structures at the base of the neck. Neurological compression is the most common sign of thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, the blood vessels are less common. Oh, one thing though, remember, the subclavian artery, what comes off that that's really important? The vertebral arteries come from the subclavian arteries and they supply blood to the brain. So bear that in mind, if the thing, the thing, the thing. Um, and the thoracic outlet, the thoracic inlet, and the superior thoracic aperture are all the same thing, and the inferior thoracic aperture is uh, something else. All right? Okay, hopefully that was a quick one. Um, and uh, another little quick note, if you're watching this kind of uh, soon after I upload it, then COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic is a thing. Um, there is a chance that the university will shut down. In fact, I've just heard that the university is gonna stop face-to-face -face teaching for courses from, was it 23rd of March to the 1st of May, except for the graduate entry program, graduate entry medicine program and the physician associates program, which are the two programs I teach mostly on. So I think I'm gonna still be here teaching. Anyway, right, that's it. See you guys next week, hopefully, if I'm allowed in the lab.